Okay, in the uh, next few minutes, uh, we are uh, going to have a stroll together into what's happening in media and entertainment environment from a more detailed business per perspective. And I'm going to show you what I used to front with my customer in my daily job. So, okay. so again, what's happening? What is uh, the incumbent transformation that we are attending uh, day by day? And to introduce you what's happening, I'm going to show you a brief video clip by this man. Every leading company in the world in 10 years' time will be a technology company or will be a declining business. So it's not, we shouldn't put a label on this anymore. It is survival. You either go digital or you go out of business. There's no option anymore. In 250 years, when we've looked at technology disruption occurring historically, uh, when you look at something like the internet or smartphones or the big four disruptors I'm going to talk about in a minute, no industry incumbent has survived by keeping their business model the same. So there are four major disruptive forces we have to look for and make sure we have a strategy to uh, deal with. The first and, and largest disruption that's coming over the next uh, 10 to 20 years is uh, artificial intelligence, AI and robotics. Uh, let me show you one uh, quick video. Um, if we could have you uh, show the video from Tesla, please. Um, this, uh, this shows you the Tesla factory. Uh, as you can see from the factory floor of uh, Tesla's uh, production line, it's all automation and robotics. But it's what Elon Musk says about this environment which you should all listen to. He says, the reason there are no humans on the factory floor at Tesla is the only way they can produce enough Teslas to meet their demand is to remove humans from the factory floor because humans slow down the production process to human speed. Okay? So I want you to think about this. When you think, whether you're thinking about uh, health, the health sector, transportation, uh, tourism, uh, banking and finance, agriculture, any area that you're looking at today, if you have humans involved where automation can replace those humans, you will remain uncompetitive. You cannot compete. So uh, the number one thing, if you're in uh, a services business, for example, if you require a signature on a piece of paper to get, deliver a service today, your business is at risk. So, scaring, but no panic, no panic, because even though Brad King is scaring us, there is another man that can... Uh, help us to understand how to manage this transformation. And this is a man we know very well, is this one. So, we must be able to be responsive to change. So, no panic. We can manage the transformation. And we can transform ourselves to manage uh, what's happening and be responsive to change. So, some trends. Mobile traffic volumes is dramatically increasing. So what does it mean? It means that more and more people is using mobile devices in the, in, in the daily activities. Okay. And this growth is 21% year by year. Okay. So we are uh, attending to a very huge digital explosion. We are overwhelmed by data day by day, and it's very important for us, this trend, 89% of generated traffic volume by mobile devices will be for uh, audio and video streams, okay? So, this, this trend and transformation uh, outlines a sort of community and audience quite different from uh, 
what we are used to know. So let's talk about the transformation, how we have to react and to be responsive to this change. So I, I think we have to move from the, what I call the blind push model, okay? Where we have pillars such as uh, uh, your contents were more or less the same for the whole audience and you had no touch point with your customers. Okay, so uh, we talk about uh, newspaper and magazine to the kiosk or broadcasting TV and so on. And you were aware that your audience uh, um, used to um, consume this content, for example, on the radio in the morning, on the TV in the night, uh, reading news uh, at a certain time of, the, of their time. So, actually, this is quite different. It's moving and transforming dramatically. In this way, the selective pool model. People nowadays want to drive their time, want to be um, free to use their time and to use content when they want, where they want, and uh, uh, what they want, okay? So they used to, to behave in such a way. This is the same for me, for example, in the morning when I am in the underground and I read my digital book on my mobile phone. So someone reading an e-book, for example, listening favorite music, then finding, mentioning, for example, a place in the book, uh, jumping to a deep dive of, on Wikipedia, for example, to know more about this place, okay, and uh, saying, wow, it's very interesting, this place, beautiful place, so I would like to go there. I jump to booking to uh, try to see if I can go there for my next holidays, and I want to share this information, the Price of the price of the booking and the place with someone, okay? And then I jump back to my book reading, and then I find some quotes, interesting quotes on the book I want to share on Facebook with my friends. And maybe I want to suggest to read that, that book to uh, other people, friends, and so on. So you can easily understand that it's not a so linear way to read a book nowadays. It's all about uh, driving my time, my interest, and what I want to share with other components of my life. So more or less, this is the, the modern society we have to front with media and entertainment. So all is fast, shared, omnichannel, linked, connected, and uh, self-using, okay? And we have some imperative. We, we have to front mobility, real time, um, content used when I have time and in a, in a certain context. Where what I mean with context is very simple to understand if, I, if you think, for example, I can read the book while I wait the bus, okay, but if I have heavy rain in that moment. I cannot read the book because I have to, to, to keep my bag with one hand and the umbrella with the other one. So the context can influence dramatically my behavior. And you have to consider that my behavior is different uh, from another person, but it's different in different times in the, in, during the day and depending upon the context around me. If I have strikes and I have no bus, if I have heavy, heavy rain, and so on. <clears throat> oh, a very important thing I have to, I, I want to drive your attention to uh, two very important pillars uh, regarding the digital explosion. The first one is to, uh, you, you will be, uh, you will have a lot of information by going into digital technologies. So first thing, you have to guarantee your audience to protect their information. Okay, don't forget that whenever you have information from someone, you have to protect uh, 
uh, in terms of law, of course, and regulatory, but also in terms of uh, brand reputation in, uh, uh, to your audience. Okay, so this is the first pillar, and this is regulated by, by law, of course, data protection and security. The second pillar is privacy. So also in this case, uh, you have the regulation to protect uh, audience privacy, but you have to, you can behave in different ways depending upon, for example, if you have, con if you have consent to use information for marketing purposes or not. So let's have a brief look about what can you do, for example, uh, in these two cases. The first one, when you have the, the consent to use information for marketing purposes, for example, you can uh, uh, profile your audience and try to better understand how you, your uh, audience is uh, behaving person by person to fine tune your services and provide relevant content for each spe specific person. And this is very important, for example, for me. I don't want to be overwhelmed by uh, general information. I, I would like to be profiled to have specific information I want, for example. But at the same time, you have uh, some population that is not, does not agree to provide information for marketing purposes. So what can you do with this kind of, with this set of information? You can study the population simply, not one by one, but as a population trend. As the same, uh, 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 as a, it's more or less the same as a marketing research, for example. So you can study trends, patterns, and uh, behavioral metrics. So uh, you can have more insight about uh, what is interesting for the world population, what is the distribution of your audience, and you can align your vision and your business goals against the, the distribution and the usage of your contents of your audience. So, oh, pardon. In the first case, in the first case, you can set up a one-to-one -one relationship. And when I talk about relationship, I uh, say about something very uh, important. What is a relationship? A relationship, imagine a friendship relationship, overlap relationship. You know each other and you try to anticipate each other's needs, fears, wishes, dreams, and so on. So this is what I mean when I talk about a relationship. You have to set up a very valuable relationship with the audience that provides you, uh, you their, their consent to use information for marketing purposes, not for spamming, okay? And the second, in the second case, you can study the population, maybe to be more effective, for example, when you acquire uh, lists uh, or prospects from uh, brokering from data brokers and you want to expand your customer base, you can buy list of prospects and you can segment and require specific list of prospects and be more effective in that case. But please keep in mind, never stalk your audience and always be relevant. Nowadays, we are overwhelmed about information, we don't need uh, uh, any more uh, massive data, we don't need quantity, we need quality. So be relevant, always be relevant for your audience. Now, we have also some opportunities for our business force into the digital world. So let's see uh, very briefly what are these op opportunity? So, we used to call this opportunity data monetization. What, what I mean for data monetization? Data monetization is the uh, capability to exploit value from this huge amount of data. Okay, what I mean exploiting value? Exploiting value can be explained in two different branches. The first one 
is creating value by doing better my core business, okay? So I can use all this data coming from my audience, the, this new digital data, to uh, do more with being more cost effective with less cost and uh, creating, uh, for example, upsell, cross-sell for my audience and uh, expanding, for example, my customer base. So in this case, we have a sort of internal value created on my core business. But why not? I can also create an external value. So I can create new business that are, I'm, I'm not thinking at the moment. I can create a new business by using the data and create value maybe for someone else, okay? So let's have a look from a business perspective about how I can create value on my core business. First example, I can go into one-to-one -one relationship with my customers. So I can know them better, I can provide them better insight, I can provide better content, more profile content, and I can uh, contact them from cross-selling, for cross-selling, upselling, and so on. So the one-to-one -one relationship is the first value that you can acquire by going into digital technologies. So it's not the same to uh, put the newspaper or the magazine to the kiosk and having no touch point with your, your audience. Here you have a touch point with the audience. So exploit the touch point to create a valuable relationship. Less churn and more loyalty. But at the same way, you are attractive. So can you imagine someone going day by day, uh, every day on a telecommunication website? Why going on a telecommunication or on a bank website? We all used to go on a media content website because we, we want to read the news, we want to read content, we want to be informed, so you are attractive. So you, have a, you will have a lot of user-generated content, uh, a lot of collaboration between readers on your website. Uh, why not you can set up gamification? What is gamification? Let me play on your website. I can write stories, for example. I can write books. I can upload my own books. So I can be not only a reader, also a writer. I can share with someone else. And why not? We can set up a community to write a book all together. OK? So let me play. Involve me. And you will be a data multiplier. You will be a bureau of data. You, you will have a lot of data in your, in your uh, digital properties. So you can exploit all these uh, uh, data coming from the new digital technologies. And you will have more profile audience all around the world. No, no geography dependent. If I am an Italian co uh, content consume, consumer and I go to the US, for example, I move to the US for six months, I want to be informed about what's happening in Italy. So I, can, I cannot buy, of course, my newspaper, my usual newspaper, but I can go on the website on, on my preferred newspaper and see what's happening and interacting. So you have no more geography. You, have a, you will have a broader audience, of course, and uh, more focused on digital advertising. So you, you can set up spaces on your pages, on, on your mobile apps, and provide marketing insights and marketing push for, uh, of course, also digital advertising. So, uh, this example was about uh, internal monetization, but also external monetization is, uh, is possible. So this is an example of what we call data alliances. Or sometimes you can uh, maybe you have heard uh, <coughs> about, uh, sorry, 
about open innovation, data sharing. What is data alliances? Data alliances is uh, more companies that used to ally and work together to share their data and create value for all the partners. Okay, so each company uh, has, is, a, let me say, a sort of short sight because they tend to uh, see their customers or, or audience from the business perspective. By fusing data coming from different, uh, different companies, uh, each company can have a sort of more broader insight about, about all population behavior. So this is a case of data lines. But we also have cases, for example, imagine you want to create value for a third party company, maybe for a retailer, and you have a sort of data alliance which has a, a great insight of the, of the population. You can fuse different data into a big data analytics machine to create what we call propensity scores. So for example, you can predict that my need is to move for a certain time in next month, or you can predict uh, that uh, I have, for example, a uh, green sensitivity. So I can, uh, I can be more inclined, more inclined to some magazine, uh, respect others, for example. And you can predict uh, that I am uh, a high churner, so you can set up a proper relationship with me to anticipate the risk of churn and try to involve me in, uh, in some way in order to avoid the, this churn risk. Okay, and so on. You can provide, for example, to third parties your population inside. I just told you, you can describe your population uh, with trends, with patterns, with the uh, behavioral context. So you can provide to third party, for example, uh, which is the uh, most interest topic for the population, for your audience, which is uh, the uh, more interesting and sensitive topic uh, for someone, for someone else, uh, segmented by age, by sex, uh, by school, and so on. So you can provide useful information for, for third parties, for other companies. And another example, is, for example, the proximity marketing. So you can have the app. I used to, I used to, um, to I used to use to read your, your books. And you can provide uh, marketing information when I walk around the street and when I pass uh, to uh, next to some point, some interest point. So. The last thing uh, I want to say to you, I want to drive your attention about what we call innovation. So it's very important to understand that there is no innovation without action. So can you imagine people like uh, Einstein, Tesla, Leonardo da Vinci having a lot of wonderful ideas and doing nothing? That was not innovation, of course. Okay, so don't forget that if you have a very good idea, you have to put in place your ideas. Otherwise, you are not innovating. So we put in place with, <coughs> with our customers some ideas that I showed you before. For example, this is a case of Data Monetization Alliance. And as you can see, in the Data Monetization Alliance, we had a media company, a broadcasting company, and a marketing company, okay, as well as a bank and a telco. So these companies joined together to create value for themselves and for, and for third parties' company. Okay, this is the first case. So they created a sort of propensity score augmented score for each customer of their customer base. Sorry. This is 
a second case, Octotelematics uh, was, of course, not now, a provider of black box for the cars um, for the usage-based insurance. And they used to uh, send uh, raw data to the insurance to uh, better um, adjust the, the price of the premium of the insurance. But they moved to the creation of value-added services because, you know, if you are a black box vendor, uh, it's quite easy to understand that such a black box is a technological black box, an electronic black box. Uh, if you, it's, it's, it's not rare, I think, that uh, someone can copy that, that black box and sell that black box at a lower price. But if you move to uh, value-added services, it's not so easy to replace you in your relationship with customers. So you, have, you, you can increase your, the customer loyalty and you can link your customer to you by selling value-added services. It's not, it's not easy to create intelligence starting from raw data and deliver high-value services. Okay, this is the, another example of business transformation of a company we had for Octotelematics. And this is the, another example. Frankfurt Airport exploited the, all the data coming from at the airport for gates, security checks, check-in, and so on, to create, uh, uh, to, they, they exploit this data for security, for an enhanced security, and also for marketing purposes. So maybe you don't know, but sometimes the gate of your flight is moved to get you uh, work. Where are the store points? It's, a, it's, a <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, it's strange to think, but it's, it's, it's reality. So I can move the gate because I know, for example, that a, a crowd of uh, Japanese people, Chinese people, is going to take that flight. So I move the gate to make them move and walk next to the stores. Why not? <coughs> so <coughs> I have a call to action for you. And uh, a lot of times, fronting my customers, they used to say to me, OK, we have just understood that uh, we can exploit data. OK, we can use all this data to create business and to improve business. What, but we don't know how. We have no know-how to take data, to collect the data, to fuse data, to create st statistical and analytical models, and to create prediction details. So how we can step into data innovation? So we created a sort of model and methodologies that is called the Innovation Lab, the Data Innovation Lab, where we work with the customer at customer site, okay, and we set up the, some work groups enabled by technology, enabled by methodology, and enabled by process, uh, people skills, where we have some processes cycling around themselves and intersecting with other processes. So for idea generation, for example, uh, idea generation is a sort of cycling, brainstorming, with, with, uh, where everyone can uh, generate ideas about new business cases. And sometimes some idea coming from the idea generation processes jump into the use case definition because is evaluated as uh, has, has a very good idea and you can create a use case from that idea. And some use cases jump into the prototyping phase. So you can create the, some prototypes with uh, uh, information technology and uh, analytical technology. You can create prototypes. You can evaluate the value of these prototypes. And then you can deploy in, in, into production and use in your uh, usual processes. So this is a, a way to 
uh, introduce and inject data innovation inside company. And it's very, very useful. A lot of companies uh, are asking us to use the data innovation lab. And uh, I think it's the last thing I want to say to you. Uh, since innovation is about uh, innovation, is about execution. Execution is the discipline to make things done. Uh, don't be, don't be, uh, don't avoid to stay uh, in the backstage and work to put in place an idea. So innovation is not uh, only having an idea, but is uh, collaborating and cooperating to get the idea into execution. And I, I want to leave you with a tribute to a man uh, that is, uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very proud to show you a brief video uh, for a man that I, I think made it possible. So, <clears throat> remember, innovation is about execution. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm just forgetting to say to you that you have theories, you have execution, execution can generate new theories and so on. So, welcome if you have wonderful ideas, but remember to put in place that ideas. For one, the man who took this photo, Michael Collins, which seems fitting for a man who has been dubbed the loneliest man in the universe. After the lunar module left for its famous descent, Command Module Pilot Michael Collins was left by himself orbiting the moon. And not for an insignificant amount of time. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Neil Armstrong's first steps and famous words. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But those were mere seconds of the 21 hours the duo spent on the moon. And to make matters worse, for a portion of Collins' moon orbit, his radio was completely cut off from both Earth and his fellow astronauts. For approximately 48 minutes, every trip around the moon, Collins was the most isolated man in human history. More than 200,000 miles from Earth, with no way of knowing what was happening, no one to talk to, no one to listen to. So, <clears throat> this man didn't go on the, on the moon, didn't put feet on the moon, but made it possible. And from my perspective, thank you very much to all the Michael Collins in the world. Thank you very much to all of you.